All right, Going Yard softball fans, you asked and we delivered. Not only can you enjoy listening to interviews with some of the biggest names in softball, but you can now enjoy savings from the hottest softball apparel and merchandise store on the net. We are proud to announce our affiliation with Softball Lifestyle 101. You can now save 10% off of your entire order by entering the promo code GYP10 at checkout. That's shirts, hoodies, book bags, jewelry, and much, much more. Visit softballlifestyle101.com and remember to use the promo code GYP10 at checkout for 10% off. And you can find those links in our show notes in bio. Hey, what's up, Going Yard Podcast softball fans? Today we have an excellent interview. It's actually one of two. The other uh, one is going to be on Friday. It's for the baseball portion of our podcast. But today we talk to CJ Beatty. He is known as the baseball and softball motivator. Um, in the beginning of this podcast, we in the interview, we talk uh, a lot about um, th- the mindset part of, of the sport, and it kind of works for baseball and softball. So if you listen to this on Friday as well, uh, about the first 30 minutes of it uh, is going to be what you already heard if you're listening to this today uh, on the softball episode. But uh, CJ, awesome guy, great to talk to, so inspirational. Uh, he originally hails from Winston, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He was a college baseball player at North Carolina a t State University. Uh, then he went on and he was drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, played a little bit uh, with them and also with the White Sox organization in some high A ball. Uh, and then after that, uh, he ended up getting started with his speaking career and he's a life coach and he goes so deep into so much uh, in this episode and also on Friday's episode as well. And uh, I think you guys will really enjoy it. Uh, make sure you follow him on Instagram and Twitter at CJBatty44. That's C-J-B-E-A-T-T-Y 44. And his website is CJBatty.com. Hey CJ, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey man, it's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be on this podcast. That's great, man. I, I'm looking forward to it. I watched a bunch of your videos and uh, checked out your stuff on Instagram, and um, it, you got a you got a nice nice crew behind you following you, and it's 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 awesome, and I can see why. So you're very passionate about what you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was about to say I was watching some of your videos. Made me want to put a put a helmet and get a bat back in my hand and go try it again. So. Appreciate you taking the time to do this and talk to our listeners. Yeah, man, no worries. I, you know, I'm starting to get that a lot. You know, people, parents are are tuning in more to me. I'm getting a very high influx of parents following me, and they're like, man, where were you at when I was coming through? Because you make me want to put a helmet and go to the cages. Yeah. I'll say we didn't have anything. We didn't have no YouTube. Or, I mean, YouTube was just starting when we were playing, so, you know, it was all just yeah. like highlights on ESPN or – you know, Sunday conversations and stuff like that on ESPN. Exactly. Um, if you can, CJ, for our listeners who aren't familiar with you uh, completely and everything that, that you've accomplished in your life, can you talk a little bit about uh, your high school experience playing baseball uh, and how that ultimately led you to North Carolina A&T? Yeah, man. I, you know, I started playing baseball in the ninth grade at Parkland. Well, I didn't start playing baseball in the ninth grade. It's just that a ninth grade year, I played at Parkland High School in Winston-Salem. Ended up graduating from Glenn High School, transferred to Glenn. Uh, they were a stronger baseball program at the time, and my parents really wanted to uh, make that move to continue to push me uh, as a player. You know, you definitely want, if you're the best one, you want to go somewhere else where you're not the best one, so you can continue to strive to be the best one, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but then I went on, I received... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's uncommon to say this at this day and age, but back in uh, my high school years at Glenn, after my junior year finished, I received 65 letters to go to basically any baseball institution in the country. Wow. And, um, I mean, it was it was crazy. I have, like, a picture. I got to find it somewhere. But it's a picture where I had them all laid out on the table. It was crazy. But I chose to go to North Carolina A&T, receive the full scholarship, and he was like, man, they don't get full scholarship in baseball. He's lying. I was like, honey, I got the documentation. <laughs> like, I got, all base, I got all baseball money. So it was a blessing. And that's why I'm 
proud to say it because it was a blessing for me and my family, especially coming from um, a family where we're trying to they were trying to put uh, three other kids through school as well. So obtaining that full scholarship was a tremendous blessing for me and my family. So what um, what was the main reason for North Carolina A and T? I mean, I, I I've read a couple things about it. You know, it was close to home, um, you know, close to your church, all the all the above. Um, can you just talk about a, a little bit of about the the main reason why you you wanted to go there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, at first, to be honest with you, at first I wanted to go to Florida State, but you can't you, you don't like to go somewhere in the end that you didn't get a letter for. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to Florida State. Uh, and uh, things like that, but um, then I then I um, went to I switched that to Virginia UVA. I was like, man, I'm about to go with the Wahoos, man, all day, every day. Cavaliers, what's up? And uh, got a bunch of letters from them. But then I realized on my one of my official visits to NC State, I saw how far the drive was for for, and I'm a homebody. So just being an hour and 45 minutes from NC State, I was just like, man, what in the world? So I said, if I can't handle the hour and 45 to NC State, I know I can't handle Charlottesville. <laughs> so I quickly I quickly said, oh, sorry, I'm not going there. Uh, Elon came on board with a nice size scholarship, too. And I went on a good visit with them. And I was like, man, this is great. I'm going to Elon. Uh, it's right down the road, 40 minutes drive. Man, it's, oh, that's great. And then at the darkest hour, but turned out to be the lightest hour, A&T called and said, listen, you come play with us, we'll give you full scholarship, all baseball money. You just got to make sure you come in there, do what you're supposed to do with your grades. It'll be open to you every year. And you're going to be top five in the lineup. And you're going to be our guy. I was just like, oh, you telling me as a freshman, I'm going to be your guy. I said, man, I'm going there. But plus it helped out that it helped out that, uh, Coach Shoemate and A and T the year before went down to regionals, and they and they they uh, took took a game from Clemson inside of Clemson's monstrous stadium. So I was just like, oh my god, like this this team is like making some moves, and they're only twenty minutes from my house. So that's that's what really played a big a big uh, component in me going to North Carolina A and T. Now, can you talk about some of the um, things you did there that made you successful, that allowed you to be get, to get drafted eventually, uh, you know, by the St. Louis Cardinals and what that whole process was like leading up to it? You know, I mean, obviously you had the stress of getting a scholarship and then ultimately comes the stress of performing on the field to give yourself another opportunity to continue. So what was that like for you? I mean, it was, you know, I wouldn't even say it was stressful. Because at the end of the day, if you build it the right way off the foundation of hard work and off the foundation of falling in love with, with uh, the grind, like it was never hard work. I mean, it was never stressful for me. Of course it was hard work, but it was never stressful. But that, that, the everyday thing for me was just I got to get better every day. You know, my father instilled that inside of me. I always took my bucket of balls, went outside. Even when I didn't have anybody thrown to me, we had this big open field. I used to working my head in an eye coordination, just the old school, toss the ball up and hit it. Mm-hmm. You know, I did, I did that a lot, uh, invested in the hit away. We put a pole up in the backyard and, you know, Derek Jeter was on the box. So like any other kid, I felt like I was going to be the next Derek Jeter because I was using the hit away, <laughs> you know? So yeah. um, it was just a lot of hard work that went into it. But I feel like a lot of people stress themselves out uh, worrying about the X's and O's, that they would just use that energy, just trying to hone in on their skills every day. Now you you played with uh, the Cardinals organi- organization, uh, played some high A ball. Um, what was the what was the biggest change going from college to playing professional baseball? College to professional baseball. I think the first thing that that stands out that everybody wants to hear, man, it was that velocity in pitching. The, I mean, when you go to pro ball, of course, in, in college. You're going to have, especially your conferences are different. Mm-hmm. SEC, what you're going to see on a regular basis. ACC, what you're going to see on a regular basis, and so on. But when I got to pro ball, it felt like everybody was throwing Tylenol pills. I thought <laughs> everybody was throwing grains of rice. I was like, what in the world was that? Was, was that was that it? What was that that went by? <laughs> um, but I and I had it, that was the, that was a major adjustment for me. It was just. Getting everybody's throwing low nineties. Everybody that comes out of the pen was throwing mid nineties. You know, at my college, it was like eighty-seven to eighty-seven to ninety. 
And then if the closer's coming in, he's 90-92. No, that was the pitcher. That's the starting pitcher at, at the pro level. So that was the biggest adjustment for me. Can you just talk a little bit about the difference in, you know, you have a plan and a workout routine, you know, that comes along with being at a college at an institution. What is that like as a professional and having to, you know, take ownership of putting your own work in um, and being successful and, you know, working through some of those failures that come with being a prospect? Yeah. See, the problem, the problem is, and that's why the, the major league teams have, and experts in place, professionals in place to help you with that transition because it's a huge transition. In college, you go from having people kind of take you by the hand on what to do, you know. But when you get to pro ball, they'll have a, a little period where they're trying to help you transition into that. But if you wasn't a 16-year-old international player or, or something, somebody signed like that that came over when they're like 14, 15, or however young they are coming over, they expect you to get with it and get on board quickly. So it's important to establish a routine, get with guys that have been there, ask questions. You know, that's one thing that helped me out. I, I just, I asked the veterans, hey, what's a typical day like for you? What are you doing? What time do you wake up? You know, what kind of diets do you have? You know, these are some of the things that help, uh, you help with the longevity of a person's career. Because if you don't have a routine or any type of daily routines or things in place, you're, you're really... Um, decreasing your your career expectancy in the minor leagues for sure hmm. now you also spent a couple seasons in the major league uh in in australia and also uh some independent ball as well can you talk about how that all came about how long you did it for and um you know what that experience was like yeah man i i played in australia for the brisbane bandits in the abl i played two seasons with them over there it was a freaking awesome opportunity. Amazing people over there, the community. And if, if I get the question asked a lot, what's the difference? I think the difference is that it's more intimate. It's more intimate. You don't have the stadiums that pack out at 3,000, 4,000, up to 9,000 people. You know, this is an intimate setting where the stadium is packing out at 1,500. But they're all, I feel like they're right behind you, like you're taking batting practice. Everybody's packed in and, and all the way wrapped around the building. I mean, wrapped around the um uh, the fences hanging over the fences. It's, it's really a different feeling, but it's more intimate where you feel like, man, this is, you're, you're putting on for your town. Um, but I played over there for two seasons. Um, I also played independent ball, which granted me that opportunity to be seen for the Washington wild things back in 2013. But I've been playing in the, I played a little, I played a little independent ball for about seven. I want to say about six years, about six years. I was playing independent baseball. You know, I always wondered because every week when we see our downloads for our podcast, we have Australia on the on there just about every single week as uh, consistent downloads. And I was in my head, I'm thinking, I mean, is, is baseball really that big? Because I just don't know, you know. Um, but I guess it, it sounds like they're pretty passionate about it. That's pretty neat to hear. Yeah, it's, it's it's growing. It's rapidly growing over there. It really is. They they have club teams throughout the entire country. Um, all over, and it's it's growing. To see where it is now, to see where the league is now. I mean, they they have an expansion team uh, from Taiwan. I, I think. Don't quote me, but I, I, they have some teams over there now. The first Chinese team is one of those teams that's over there right now. That that they have just uh, expanded the league over there. They definitely just opened up baseball in New Zealand. So they had the first team this year in New Zealand. They're doing some big things over there in Australia for sure. Awesome. Now, you talked about asking questions, speaking to veterans. Uh, one of the things we saw uh, coming up with some questions for this uh, interview with you uh, was your relationship with Albert Pujols that you had uh, and how you learned about mental toughness from him. Uh, can you just you know, lend an ear to what that experience was like now and, and seeing how much success? And I mean, you know, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer all the way. Uh, and what that experience was like looking back at it now and how much that's meant to you. I mean, that, that really was the turning point in my life for um, motivation, like understanding mental toughness came from the day that the Cardinals allow Albert Pujols to talk to the minor leaguers. <clears throat> and we had a day where he was, a, he was, a, we had a speaker, you know, they try to bring in speakers, but they brought in Albert this time to come down and talk to us. And that right there really changed the perspective on how I looked and attacked life. 
he came and talked to us about mental toughness and, and how he stays mentally sound throughout the whole year. And his preparation was impeccable. I mean, this guy was really showing up at like four o'clock in the morning on the backfields, under lights, in the cages, working off of a team. Four o'clock in the morning. Mm. And when you and if you have to think about it from the from a personal standpoint, back then, if you would have said, Hey CJ, let's get up at four o'clock in the morning and go hit off the tee, I'd be like, No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but then at the end of the day, when you when you look at greatness, such as Albert Pujols, and you see the things that he does to make him great, to put him in that category, and then you get why he is and why you're not. You know, so he was really uh he was he was really big in my life when it comes to getting routines, being disciplined, being consistent, putting forth the effort day in and day out, and paying attention to the little things. You know, he was real big. Tony La Russa was big in that because we had him come in and speak to Adam Wainwright. You know, it was some great guys, but Pujols really um, catapulted that, catapulted that in my life. What's um during those sessions and, and there's probably not too many organizations in all of baseball that are better than the Cardinals than developing talent. But what was probably one of the top questions you always went in there with whenever one of these speakers would come in and speak to you guys? How do you handle failure? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, just wanting to act, that's like the number one question that everybody wanted to know was how do you, how do you guys handle failure? The pressures of, looking to perform every single day like what what do you go through uh what what type of (laughs) mentality do you got to have to be able to handle this failure and that's that's that was a lot of the popular questions that was always brought up to these superstars it's funny you said that you part of my pun but you teed that up perfectly for me because my next question was your favorite quote was never be afraid of failure because without failure success uh, becomes nearly impossible uh, in a sport yeah. like in a sport like baseball and softball. Failure is inevitable, but different players take failure failure differently than others. So, how do you teach mm-hmm. that to your audience? How do you teach that to the players you talk to? And uh, how should the young players listening right now approach failure? I always tell them to embrace it, to welcome it in. You know, the analogy I like to. Uh, to draw up for them to see the picture I like to paint for them is like failure comes knocking on your door. Open that door, see that it's failure, let him in. Because while you're working, while failure's on the inside, you're working hard at this point to, to get failure to leave. But when failure finally leaves your house, leaves your mentality, leaves for that time, that particular span, When it leaves, wisdom is always left behind. Mm -hmm. So I let let the guys that are listening, the girls that are listening, the parents that are listening, the coaches, whoever is listening to this, you have to understand how to embrace the failure. Because once I learned in my career that every time I fail at something, I get that much closer to reaching my goal, I started to welcome it in. I was just like, okay, well, I failed. That means I'm very much closer to achieving my goal. Okay. I failed again. Well, that means I'm definitely close. That was my perspective. Hmm. And it helped. It helped later in my career. I wish I would have been able to go back and use this perspective. Where would I be? Where could I be? You know, so that's what I encourage a lot of people, whether they're in sports or not. Embrace your failures. Let it sting. Make an adjustment and keep fighting. You know, one of the things I see uh, with my son's wrestling team, for example, uh, one of the, the mottos they have on the back of one of their shirts, um, you know, there's, it's not winning and losing, it's winning and learning. And I think that's so important. It sounds so cliche, but it, I mean, if you really take that in and apply that to life it, it, anywhere, whether it's in baseball, softball, or just in life in general, um, you never really lose um, you know, because you're just, you know, you're still here today. Um, you, you learn yep. something, yep. And you move forward. Yep. Winning, winning and learning and winning and winning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I just wanted to, to jump in and ask, cause we both have sons and daughters that play softball. They play field hockey. They play basketball. They wrestle. Um, what is the advice you give to parents to talk to their kids about the failure? <laughs> Obviously it's beyond, um, just cliches and sayings, but, you know, we all have seen our kids uh, go through failure. How, how do how should parents pick their children up from those failures and make them understand that it's much more than just this game? 
Well, I'm gonna I'm take this and go a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Go for it. I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the things, the issues that parents have or situations they have as their kids get older, because the inevitable is going to happen. They will develop a closed ear to you. It's it's, it's inevitable. Mm-hmm. It's a 99.9 percent chance that your child is going to develop a, some sort of a closed ear to the guidance. But that, it happens to everybody. So the best thing that I feel that parents can do to help when it comes to failure, so it won't be like it's a nagging thing, like pick your head up. I know you got, you know, just keep. I feel like you have to work on the back end of connecting more with your child. When you can connect more with the lines of communications are more clear when it comes to like, when it feels like it's coming from a more of a, you know, let's do it. You know, what, what you need? Let's come, let's come together as teammates in this thing. We're, they're more open to listening. They're more open to hopping back up, picking themselves up quicker than feeling like the parent is always telling them, hey, I just want what's best for you. You know, I just want you to get up there and give it everything you got. They know that. But th- and the reason why they can listen to it from me is because I don't have a dog in the race with them. A lot of the disconnect that parents have when it comes to trying to teach their kids to uh, overcome failure is just the way the tone the way the words that they use to be able to encourage the kids. Come, come under, try to find another way uh, of understanding, because at the end of the day, we're, we're all teammates when it comes to trying to pep somebody up, your teammate. Mm-hmm. You know, and I feel like that right there needs to be said because a lot of parents are, are feel like they're helping and they're doing the best they can, but if they can work on their communication, on connecting, it might be, hey, with your, with your son or daughter, after the game might not be the best time. Just, just give them a pat on the back and say, we get them next time. Let, let them cool off and maybe hit them up later on that evening. Maybe hit them up first thing in the morning once they had time to reflect on it. You know, things like little tactics like that is what's going to really help make that line of communication clear so they can be pumped up and ready to go for that next at bat. How important is reflecting? You just kind of brought that up. I want to, like, how, how important is that for the player to reflect back uh, after whatever's happened? You failed a test, you struck out with the bases low, well, whatever the situation may be. How important is that reflection? Man, it, it's, it's, it's imperative. It's vital. It's very important that you reflect. People don't like to reflect on failures. Why? Because it hurts. You're reliving the hurt. Why do I want to relive the hurt? I want to turn the page. But if you don't start the process of turning the page, part of the process is reflection. It's, you have to have reflection because you got to see where it went wrong. You got to see when it was going good, when it started to taper off, and you got to see when you started to crash, when the wheels started to come off. And that's in the form of reflection. So it's very important for you to identify your pitfalls during the situation, during the game, during whatever it is that you're trying to do. And then reflection will be able to show you where you need improvements. Mm. That's awesome. I could listen to you talk, talk for hours. And on that, on that note, um, what got you into motivational speaking and and life coaching and, and do you focus mainly on athletes or do you speak at, you know, for corporate events and all the above? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do speak at all the above, uh, uh, Corporate events are coming in now, you know, because they, they, I go to these uh, TBM workshops, the baseball motivated workshops, the softball motivated workshops that I do around the country. And these dads and moms are part of Fortune 500 companies. And they're like, listen, we need you to come in and motivate our sales team. <laughs> so, so <laughs> corporate events have started to, uh, started to move now and we're excited to be able to bring those on. But man, motivational speaking started for me. It was an accidental, really, uh, because I felt I had my role models growing over the Ken Griffey Juniors, the Derek Jeters, and to see them move. I remember back in the day, like in Sports Illustrated, the magazine, mm-hmm. when Ken Griffey Jr. and Derek Jeter were in there going to different random high schools and delivering speeches, and they would have a spread on them going to such and such high school and seeing the kids just gravitate around them. That right there really inspired to say, inspired a spark in my life to say, if I make it to a professional level, I want to do that too. So once I made it to the professional level, I held myself to that. Once I got drafted, I was excited beyond anything 
to be able to say, now I get to, I mean, it was crazy. I was like, first thing I got drafted, I was like, yes, I get to go speak at schools. Like that was, that was important to me because I mm-hmm. saw my role models do it. I get to go speak at schools. I get to go encourage the kids. I get to go sign autographs. I get to go make the kids happy. I get to go talk about, you know, you know, anti-bullying speeches. I get to do the things that I saw my role models do. So along the way, principals, after I talked, and I was speaking for free because it was just my community. I felt like this is my duty as a professional athlete to, to do that, you know. And um, next thing you know, it principals were like, principals were like, are you getting paid for that? And I was like, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, no, I'm not here to charge. And he was like, are you sure? I said, no, I'm sure. But they said, you should do this. You should do this on the road. Like, you're good. People, nobody comes in here and has all of these kids doing, you know, paying attention like that. You should do this, like, professionally. My grandma always told me whenever you see a lot of, whenever you hear a lot of people say the same thing, it must be true. So I put that to the test. You know, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after baseball, I said, well, a lot of people say I should speak, but surely I can't make a living doing that. And I looked up, I looked up some more uh, motivational speakers along the way, and I saw what they were getting paid to help people. I said, you know what? If I'm going to get paid to do something, I'd rather get paid to help people. So I saw it after to start out my company, Motivational Nuggets, back in 2013, and uh, I've been professionally speaking uh, since then. So it's just been it's been great. Wow. Two things, real quick. What was it like going back and speaking at your college at A and T to that baseball team and those players? Uh, and also, how important are role models in life to younger athletes and, you know, what they should aspire to be and how they handle them, themselves on and off the field? Man, going back to speak at A&T was <laughs> – it's always great to go back and give back. And I call it going back to give back what was given to you. You know, and I felt like, once again, it was my duty to go back to A&T where – I got that opportunity to get the full scholarship. Why would I not want to go back and help the next? So going back to talk about, you know, why not use that speech on YouTube? I mean, that, that speech is doing some phenomenal numbers because it's true. Why not you? So I encourage anybody to watch that, that video and just to be inspired to take on their 2019 this year. But, um, you know, role models are very important. I mean, it's very important. I wouldn't be where I'm at today probably if it wasn't for my two role models. Like, here I am impacting, like, my YouTube channel has over two point something million channel views. I'm reaching over, I'm in 220 different countries, close to 100,000. You know, I mean, the numbers are just crazy, but it all started from two role models. So just looking at that right there alone, how two role models, Derek Jeter has never met me. King Griffey Jr. has never met CJ Baby. But the impact that they had in my life allows me to impact thousands. And if that ain't deep, that's a drop mic. I'm dropping the mic and I'm walking <laughs> off stage. That's deep. That is deep. Uh, you know, so I think, I think role models are very important. That's awesome. Now, I'm sure over the years, you, you've had many baseball and softball players reach out to you for advice. What are some of the top questions you get from players? <laughs> Number one, what do scouts look for? <laughs> That's the number one question, especially, you know, once I became, in 2016, once I became a pro scout in St. Louis, uh, you know, that was the number one question. It was like, man, parents, coaches, players, what scouts look for? Hey, does a scout look for this? I'm small. Um, Am I going to be okay? Am I going to have a chance to play? Am I going to have a chance to get drafted? Uh, I'm slow. I mean, just just the scouts question is the number one question I get all the time. What do scouts look for? Um, Also, I I saw recently um, a post on your Instagram that talks about the importance of academics and trying to land a spot at a D one on a D one team or even any college team. Really, Um, this seems Uh like seems like it's a no brainer. But I think there are a lot of kids out there that have the mindset of, especially these days. Well, I'm so good at that sport that colleges are going to take me regardless of my grades. Can you talk about that? Because we got a lot of young listeners that listen to us that are in the uh, high school um, part of their life right now. And, um, you know, that just think that, hey, I'm going to be the next Bryce Harper and just anybody's going to want me, you know. So if you could talk about that, it'd be awesome. 
Hey, heck yeah. And here comes another baby moment where I just keep it real. <laughs> if you guys follow me, I keep it real. I let them know. Because the reason why I call them the TBM family, the TSM family, because I talk to them like brothers and sisters. I, I, this ain't no sugar coat. I'm going to start it off by saying this, guy. If you out here thinking that you're going pro with terrible grades, you're sadly mistaken. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> you, what you have to do is understand that your grades in some way, shape, or form reflect your character. Well, what if you're a guy, because I, ha- I want to set the record straight, too, on the podcast. There could be some, some people out there with some learning disabilities and say, well, how can that happen? This message is corely for the ones that don't take their education serious because, because they can but they choose not to because they think their physical abilities is all the scouts want to see. You're sadly mistaken. Hmm. Because the first thing a college coach comes to me, a college coach comes to me and asks, they're going to say, hey, CJ, how's this guy? Oh, man, he's great. He's wonderful. You know what the second thing is before they continue to dig deep inside of this guy? is what's his grades. That's what, I don't care what college it is. It's what's his grades. Because they do, I mean, you think about it. That coach has his name on the line to keep his, to keep feeding his family with his salary. And why would he put that on the line, signing a knucklehead that displays that he cannot handle his stuff in the classroom? She can't handle her grades in the classroom. That's a liability. I can't put a scholarship that I, that I can easily give to somebody else more deserving on somebody that shows that they do not want to tow tow it in the classroom. So if you're a person listening to this, if you want to wow a coach, just get your grades up to the best of your ability. Don't settle. Continue to strive for it. Because if you are a person that does good grades and you're a great great ball player, then you're, you're telling them that you're a special kid. And being a special kid deserves a special scholarship. Um, one thing that kind of comes up, whether it's baseball or softball, uh, generally, and one thing that I think me and Dan have really discovered through this podcast is that no path is always the same to where you want to get to. Um, can you just, you know, as a, you're a coach, scout, can you just lend an ear that, you know, when you talk about the grades, it, it, can you just talk about how going to JUCO or Division Two or Division Three uh, isn't doesn't mean you failed or whatever? I mean, but you just talk about where that situation in life, going to the best situation possible to make yourself so successful, is. Oh yeah, I mean this this right here is another topic to be straight up. You ready for this one? Oh yeah. Okay, here, here we go, <laughs> guys. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Oh, man, he's going to a D1 school, so I got to go to a D1 school. So now you go into debt, try to go to a D1 school where you maybe not want to play because they really didn't want you. Guys, you got to make sure you go where you're going to play and be loved. If you want to go to a junior college, it's not the end of the day because you can transfer out. You want to go somewhere where you can develop. Then maybe a D1 school might want you. You, you don't, it's not the end of the world. There's a lot of ju- junior college major leaguers that are carrying major league money. Million-dollar athletes that started the junior college route. Million-dollar athletes that went to a Division II school that was a Division II All-American. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane to see that you have to go down the same path that everybody else is going down. Now, I get it. D1 is more sexy on paper. I got you. But is it just more than one way to skin a cat, homie? <laughs> There's more than one way to skin a cat. And all right, so make sure you go where you're loved. Make sure you can go where they might be okay with you failing a little bit, having that transition period. Go where you're loved. Don't go where, where they just want you for a statistic. Do what's best for you in your playing career because I can't scout you from the bench. Hmm. I can't scout you from the bench. Oh, look at how she's on that bench over there. She looks like a stud. Scholarship. Oh, she <laughs> looks like a stud. Signer. No, he looks like an absolute. Look how he look how he's got his arm propped on that Gator Gatorade cooler. <laughs> Sign him. No, <laughs> no, it's not happening. So at the end of the day, parents, if you're listening to this, take heed to that. Don't jump on the first thing smoking. Get out there and shop. Your kids are like show ponies. Get them right. Get them right for the pageant. Get them things right. 
make sure you make sure you weigh your options and go where you're loved and go where you're going to play. Best fit, best fit. A competitive conference where where it's going to be where you're going to get where you're going to develop and understand. Ask ask questions too, because you might be able to go to a, a, a smaller school with the intentions of transferring to a bigger school later. It's okay. Have a plan, but don't just hop on the first thing smoking. That was perfect. <laughs> I like that. Um, I wanted to ask, so when did you become a part of the, the softball world? When did that all happen? And, um, you know, w- w- what are you doing in the softball world right now? Well, I just launched the softball motivator brand. I was already in the, uh, in the industry of softball, but I wasn't officially in it because I was just a baseball motivator. But I had a lot of softball teams and coaches hit me up like, hey, we saw what you did for the boys. We want you to come over here and talk to the girls. The girls need it. So I started to speak to the girls, and and they received it, and they was doing well. And I just had a huge one in uh, Arlington, Virginia area uh, with Glory's with Glory Fast Pitch Softball. Susie Wellman asked me to come out, and we put on a big softball motivator workshop, and it was phenomenal. Over 150-something girls out there with their parents included. It was great, but it's right across. It's, it's, it's the same. Mm-hmm. If I talk about the old deck circle, it's the same on softball side. If I talk about what you should be thinking in the dugout, it's the same on the softball side. When I say on the softball side, you see when she starts her motion, you need to make sure you start your load and get your timing going. It's the same when I'm saying that on the baseball side. It's transparent across the board. And I said, you know what? It's time for me to stand up, create my logos, to put some pink in there, take some of that green out. And now the softball motivator has been born. Uh, we can tell you as podcasters, we, we originally were just going to be doing baseball. And, you know, we have daughters that, and our daughters are so passionate about softball. And, um, you know, they're, they're only 10, 11 years old right now. And, um, but th- their passion just comes through. And when we started softball, the amount of passion, I mean, I'm not putting down my baseball or baseball fans at all. But the passion and um, the uh, – I'm trying to think of the best word for it. The softball fans just came out. And, and every single week our softball episodes are the most downloaded. Uh, we have the most comments, I think, from our softball fans. It's incredible, and we love it. And um, we're, we're, you know, we, we can definitely see why you went to softball as well because very receptive – uh, group of um, gals and guys, you know, the coaches, whole nine yards. It, it, it's pretty awesome. Debbie, yeah, it, it is true. I, I haven't quite figured it out. But I can take a stab at it if you want. I went to Mohegan Sun Coaches Clinic, spoke there in 2017. And at first was the baseball clinic for two for three days. And then the last three days, the softball transitioned in with their clinic. Uh, so it was my first coaches clinic. I'm going down the big you know, the big convention escalator and down to the main floor baseball was there. I was like, Oh man, this is packed, man. Look at that. It's almost, it's almost packed out here in the registration area. Let me go inside of the expo center. Went inside of the doors. It was like, Oh man, this is good. I'm like in heaven, man. When the softball rolled in for day three days, I, the escalator wouldn't even move. That's how many people was on trying to get down there. It was standing room. You would have thought Barn Joby was there. I was like, what in the world is going on here? Who's here? The president? No, he was like, nah, the softball always brings out more people. I don't know what it is, but I just know soft. There's a lot of love for them girls out there. You yeah. know what I think it is? At, when you get older as a guy, you ain't you ain't as cute no more. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you're not cute anymore. Right. I mean, when you were like the little tyke and T-ball, you were cute. Everybody came out, wanted to support, coach pitch. Oh, look at him. He's growing up. He looks like you. He looks like you. Uh, but then when you got to the big field and, you know, like the hair and the acne and all that stuff starts <laughs> to come on your face. And you're not cute anymore. And that's really what it is. That's what I'm. That's the only thing I can rest my hat on. You know, nobody wants to come watch, you know, puberty take place on the baseball field <laughs> you know what I'm saying nobody well, that's not sexy anymore so it's kind of right. like you lose everybody you lose your guest pass list you know what I'm saying right now the only person that's coming out is when it's convenient for dad or mom is there because you know that's just in her DNA to be there through the through the good the bad the ugly but but when you're a girl you got the whole fam coming out they got t-shirts 
matching shoe strings, bows in the hair. Even dad got a bow in his hair. Why? Because <laughs> he knows who runs the house. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And and I think the other thing is, it's just the passion because I think the reason why the passion's there as well is because most softball players know that they only have a short period of time. They don't have the, they don't have the career prospects as a major league baseball player does where they can have all this money and, and have all these endorsements and all this stuff. And they know that, Hey, you know what? I, I have this short period of time where I might go pro um, but it's not, you know, obviously not as gl- glamorous as the MLB, but they have the short period of time. So why not just make the best of it and go all out? And I, I think that's part uh-huh. of it too. It's, it's pretty intense. Uh-huh. There we go. So they, now you got to stab at it, man. So now you say, according to CJ, he thinks <laughs> the guy's just not cute enough anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what is the um, reaction uh, from the girls? Um, y- y- Boy, teenage boys, you know, they got – when we grew up, we, we had Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo and PlayStation was just starting to come out, um, you know, and these boys are wrapped up in Fortnite and all these things and it seems like they have so many more distractions and it seems like girls can, can, can get focused at an earlier age um, to what they want to do. So what, what is that focus like when you're inter- inter- interacting with them in, these, in your conferences, uh, in your camps that you're doing? Man, I tell you what, it's a different animal. Like the guys, we get after it at the TBN workshops, but I feel like the energy that comes with the girls is just, it's more right. I feel like with guys, because of the macho-ness that they're growing into, the macho-ness with the guys are like, man, I got to, he's talking about some deep stuff and I like it, but I can't let everybody else know that I'm really liking it. So I'm going to, I'm going to sit here with my arms crossed a little bit, but I, after he gets done talking, I'm going to walk up there and let him know how he, how he changed my life. <laughs> but on the girl side, you got those girls tuned in from the get go, smiling, laughing, they coming together, they're sitting with each other close shoulder to shoulder. It's like, dang, like you girls are just on it. And uh, it's just different. It really is. But the guys, the guys are more locked in. It's more quiet. They're there thinking about them, thinking about getting it going, but they just don't show it on the outside as much as the females do. Naturally so. The females are more emotional. Come on now. We know that. We know that. <laughs> now, now, do you have, I, I know I, I see you on your, on your site, you, you have a good good post from your, uh, you know, a softball family. And, um, you also have, um, s- some instructional things you have up there as well. Do you have a chance to actually work one-on-one with the, with the softball players as well in, in terms of, you know, you know, whether it's hitting, fielding, things like that? Yes. Yes, for sure. I definitely teach hitting for softball as well. Um, I don't, I, I get into the, I teach defense as well, but when it comes to the specialty things, the specialty movements, the, you know, learning how to slap, I don't mm-hmm. care if I took a slap master's program. <laughs> I'm not teaching slapping. I hear you. Because I, I'm one of those I'm one of those people that if I'm old school with it. If I didn't if I wasn't of that life, I'm not gonna teach that life. Right. You're not gonna I'm not gonna be a guy that, yeah. that hits for average and now I'm about to read a book and start teaching people how to hit for power. Right. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Now I teach you how to drop bombs. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 what I did. You know, master fly balls, I can teach that all day long. But when it comes to anything else like that, I don't feel that it's right for me personally to teach anything else. So when it comes to that specialty thing, uh, especially pitching uh, at the softball level, I'm not going to teach that. But when it comes to fielding, working through the ball as an outfielder, turning the double plays, doing that across the board, oh, that's oh, you come to your boy. I got you. I got you. It's great because I, I, me and Dan, like he said, we, we, you know, we got daughters, but we kind of started this podcast for the softball side of a little bit is to dig in deeper into some of these minds for there's so many dads out there that don't have a clue where to start with their daughter or they think it's just all, <laughs> you know, they think it's all, I'm just teaching them how to play like baseball. I, there is some nuance, you know, once you get to an upper level, there are some nuances to the game that just aren't similar to baseball. I mean, the speed it, of the it, game yep, is phenomenal. It's unbelievable. That's true. And and when I when I get to that point with uh, within my softball teaching, I I do not shy away from it. I let them know if there's something that I feel like they need that they need to get, and I can't give it to them. I'll let them know. I'll let them know because there is some uh, some different facets of the game, and 
in softball that needs to be met with softball movements. What in, and let's just stay on that a little bit. Um, from some of the work that you are doing with them on the field or whether it's fielding or hitting, what are some of the common flaws uh, that you see and you're traveling from place to place, so it's not like you're just centrally located. What are some of the common little flaws you see that some of these softball players are doing that, man, you know, if mom or dad spent a little bit more time with them at, you know, five, six, seven years old, this would really help them out by the time they get to that 12, 13, 14-year-old age? I really think that, I mean, a a lot of the girls, when I do my camps and clinics, and, it, and I have a video that from a recap from the last one, we just did a, T, a TBM workshop up there and then with the Glory Fast Pitch, and we talked about it was defensive demos, defensive demonstration. I feel like a lot of the girls today, they need to work on perfecting the foundation of the fundamentals, just getting back to the basics. Because imagine this, and this is the way I coach and teach. I like to start from ground up when it comes to my lessons of hitting and lessons of hitting. I mean, lessons of hitting and lessons of fielding. The reason why is because if we have a firm foundation of fundamentals, it'll help us move that much faster towards obtaining your goal. But if we just skip the fundamentals and I try to put on, just like it's like building a house. Imagine that. Uh, how, how strong should the foundation be, CJ? Uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. Let's go, let's start working on putting shingles. Let's start working on putting shutters. Uh, yeah, the jacuzzi going upstairs. Uh, yeah, the first sign of adversity, or in that case, the first storm that comes, it's going to blow your house down because you didn't have a solid foundation of fundamentals. I go watch these girls play and, you know, when they turn the double play, they might effectively turn it, but it didn't look right. And I'm telling them as a scout, that when you're being evaluated and teaching parents that when your child is being evaluated, they must look the part. You, your, your kid could go three for three in a game with two ugly swings that were jam shots. But in your mind as a parent, they were three for three and they deserved that scholarship. And I'm like, her timing was off. That was a long swing. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to figure out why I didn't talk to your kid after the game. See, there's a lot of things on the foundational side at seven, at six years old, that you can try your best, and it's, in, it's within your control. It's just simply hitting off of the tee, getting some lessons, understanding the importance of the foundation, rolling ground balls, utilizing your lower half. These are things that doesn't cost a slew of money to, 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 uh, to obtain. It's just making sure you focus on that and stop trying to put the cart before the horse with getting all the sexy movements and all the big movements mm -hmm. before you even have the small movements. Right. Now, this might be this might not be something that you you talk uh to your to your players about um and depending on the age, but I want to know how how important since you went through college baseball and and you played professionally, how important is strength training to you and when do you think it is a good age to start implementing just a little bit of strength training into a softball player's daily routine? I really think uh, the bodies around the 12, uh, introducing it around 12, 13, primarily 12 for the softball girls. Mm -hmm. For baseball, I would say 13 because, you know, of course, girls have that, that maturity. Mm -hmm. Their bodies mature faster than the guys. Around 12 into that preteen age is when they should be. So for the window, 12 to 14, with this when this is when you need to start implementing speed and acceleration, uh, weight training. Doesn't mean that you have to be out there trying to be an Olympic weight, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, putting on 15 pounds of muscle and all. You know, no, right. no. You just need to start lifting so you can get bigger, stronger, faster. Because at the end of the day, if you are competing at one point, if you want to be in competition for a scholarship or a starting spot on a starting spot on varsity, you got to understand that's what your competition is doing. You need to be able to, and I think the age that that's appropriate starts at twelve for girls and thirteen for uh, for boys. Now you have people out here starting earlier, and it's okay to start. But I think you can start agility as soon as possible. Agility is something that you can do at five. Right. Agility is just putting putting that ladder down and doing ladder drills at five. Just getting their hand, their feet coordination, getting getting uh getting them in tune with their bodies. I think that's imperative to do as soon as possible. But the question was weight training. 
See, a lot of times we stunt our growth because we got six, seven, and eight-year-olds lifting free weights and doing all of this and trying to figure out why later on when she was six, she turned 16. She has, she has injuries or hamstring problems because you got big so fast. Hmm. You know, there's a lot of things that go into that. One thing I wanted to ask, uh, CJ, what, and, and this is kind of a topic for both in a way, is how do you feel in your scout, um, how do you feel about multi-sport athletes for females? And, and, you know, should they continue that as long as they can? Or, you know, when should you get into that sport-specific training that you kind of talked about, all those sexy things that, you know, parents want to pay for, whether it's hitting lessons or, you know, all these different things, this own private coach for this and private coach for that? You know, wh- when is it important – to, to get into those things and how long should you wait? I think it's, well, first of all, I, I love the multi sport athletes because I think every sport gives you a different mental toughness. Every sport gives you, requires a different mental, uh, mental mind frame, you know? So at the end of the day, continue to be your multi talented, multi sport, Um, player but at the end of the day when you figure out what your calling is when you figure out what your sport is the sport that you're looking to carry into college on a scholarship around around your sophomore or junior year at the latest you need to be able to focus solely on that around your sophomore maybe maybe you can get one more year of it but by your junior year you need to be well into your this is what i'm going to utilize to help get me that education in college and also play this at the college level I think that that needs to happen. But up until that point, play as many sports as possible because you're going to gain so much more. I played football, and I loved football. Baseball was my ticket. But at the end of the day, what football gave me, the grittiness, the grind, understanding the toughness that I got from that, it really helped me on the baseball field. And what I gained from baseball with the mental aspect really helped me on the football field with dissecting things, being able to handle failure. You know, so if you're a girl out here that, that looks like, you know, I want to play basketball too, but my parents are telling me to only play softball, it depends on where you're at. I would encourage if you're a parent on here to keep them in those multi-sports uh, up until that point. You start making that decision towards their sophomore year in high school and at the latest their junior year so they can be ready to make that push for that scholarship. That's that's definitely good, especially our, our girls and uh, our girls play – three sports a year and um you know i I, it runs through my head i know that my daughter is only 10 she'll be 11 soon but it's just one of those things where like all right when is it going to be too much and when to cut that when when should we pick the ones that uh you know she's she's more passionate about and it's funny you say because and and not the ramble here but my daughter just she's played field hockey basketball and, and field hockey was her first year this year she's played basketball for the past three years and she's played softball since she was three basically um you know she just said this year like oh man i don't think i I think she's starting to get passed by other girls and and she's seeing a little bit of that in basketball because she's not focusing on it like some of these aau teams that are out there that they're playing against and then she's like i don't think i want to do this and i'm like well it's okay honey you just can't quit now you know you got to finish the season out and when next season comes around maybe you'll feel differently and and we'll figure out what you want to do then but you know you got to do what you love to do and if you don't love doing it then there's no point in putting all that time, energy, and effort into it, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. Now, <clears throat> CJ, what are some of your goals over the next, like, five years as a coach, a speaker, um, specifically in the softball community? What, do you, what, do you, what would you like to do in the next five years? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I have some things uh, working, you know, with uh, Softball Factory. I'm a partner with... Softball Lifestyle 101, We Live Softball, some of the big social media pages since I'm, you know, have a good presence on social media. Uh, also getting ready to work out something with the package deal with Jen Shro and, uh, and them on social media as well. So um, just really in the softball world, I want to be that person that, that, these, that these girls go to, that these parents go to um, for, that, for that how to get back in the fight how to take it to the next level mentally. I want to bring that dynamic to the softball side because these girls need it too. I want to be that person that they check on a regular basis before going to sleep. What did he post today that can help me gain that edge for tomorrow? What did he post that can help me gain the edge on and off the field? You know, so I really think there's some big things happening for the softball motivator brand this year. 
we're releasing a motivational apparel. Uh, we're releasing apparel and there, all the aspects, and we're working out with partnering with more softball companies just to get the just to get the mental message out. Now, before we wind down the, the the episode here on the softball stuff, was there anything you wanted to bring up to the softball community that we didn't dive into um, yet? You know what? I, I have I have a motivational something for for the for the girls out there, man. I just want them to understand that when you're trying to find yourself in today's world, the best place to find it is in the mirror. You know, and that's one thing that I told the girls at the Glory Fast Pitch uh, Softball Motivated Workshop. It's in the mirrors where you're going to find yourself. You, you've never left. You are who you are. Let's make the best of it and let's get better. You know, you're who you are today, but that doesn't mean that's who you're going to be tomorrow. It's a decision. You know, so let the girls know also on this podcast that your boy is coming out with some apparel that is absolutely bananas. <laughs> so you got to be able to float this stuff in school. So follow your boy and be ready to be one of those TSM ambassadors, okay? And also, I got some softball music videos coming out along with my baseball music videos. So if you want to be featured in a music video, show your boy what you got on your page. We might be flying you out soon. Hey, you know what? I want to be featured in one of your softball videos. (laughs) (laughs) I got some some swag. He's a slow pitch legend, man. (laughs) Oh, wow. Oh, really? Now now he's he's just... Talking stuff, but <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I can hit some bombs, um, you, but slow pitch, pro- definitely not fast pitch. I, I, I've never, no, I've hey, never tried to hit a fast pitch ever in my life. If Albert Pools real couldn't quick. hit it. Nobody's going to hit. It. <laughs> Look, I'm going to tell you this much right here. We had an opportunity. I had an opportunity real quick. I had an opportunity to uh, to play in a Frontier League All Star when I was playing for the Washington Wild Things. When I made All Stars, we had a battle of the sexes. Right, it was between the MPF All Stars versus the Frontier League All Stars. Uh, let's just say <laughs> hitting uh, hitting hitting a softball is so hard. Uh, uh, you know, at first, at first, let me tell you how it was. As a matter of fact, I'm glad that we talked about this because I'm gonna create a video. <laughs> I'm gonna create a video and put it on my page of my first time facing a girl throwing, and. Uh, it, it, it was crazy. So I, I'm walking up the bat. It's a no-hitter going. I mean, you know, obviously we can't touch them. I mean, we can't hit it. It's like we're swinging a bat with no barrel. I mean, we're up there swinging. And like guys looking around like, dude, why can't I touch it? No cameras, so, no cell phones on. Nobody got to record any of this, right? It was crazy, right? So I get, I get up there and I'm like, man, this is, come on, man. All I got to do is just touch it. It's going to go like 9 million feet over the fence. I mean, the fence is only 200. Man, the first pitch. She ran her. First of all, as baseball players, we are not freaking ready for all of that movement by the pitcher. It's way too much. I was I was thrown off. The first it was O count, and I'm over here like getting ready like I normally would. And she bends over, slaps her knee, turns around, does some type of <laughs> I don't know what she twisted her body around, and sooner or later I just heard the mitt pop. <laughs> and I was like, what the heck was that? Is that legal? <laughs> Oh my god. No, I looked at the umpire and I was like, ain't no way that was legal. I felt like she was halfway to me when she released it. <laughs> oh so my boom, god. it was O one. It was O one. This is what I was facing and look, I was facing Monica Abbott. And you know, she was bringing it. <laughs> so, oh, no. so I was like, you know, in on the outside, on the outside guys, I was like, ha. Man, this is a piece of cake. On the inside, I felt like I wet myself. I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is, I can't touch this. So then she comes with, so this time, like any other guy, I say, it's easy. Just swing earlier. You'll be all right. She starts her twist, her turn, and then she mixes it up. I said, what the heck? She didn't do that the first time. And then I tried to swing early, and the ball was in the mix. And I never swung. My body, my body never allowed me to pull the bat off my shoulder because it's trying to figure out why is she, why is she doing this on the mound? It's like mesmerizing. She's like a snake, and I'm her victim. She's low. I mean, it was crazy. So it's O2. At this point, I'm begging the catcher, like, please, just throw one more of those because I have no chance if she throws anything else. It's like, all right, here comes the heater. And, of course, you know what's about to happen. She throws a freaking changeup. Oh no! 
and I swung nine times like Bugs Bunny. <laughs> I was like, what the word? That's not even fair. I went back to the dugout and I was saying, guys, we're not getting the hit today. <laughs> and we got no hit. It was, we got no hit. It was, it was ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. And girls run after that ball to run. hit it. No, that's what's scary. Yeah, seriously. I, I watch yeah. I watch 11, 12-year-olds pitch. There's a pitcher on our daughter's team, um, Jill. She she can throw – she can smoke him, and she's 11 years old. And I'm, I'm like, man, I played baseball my whole life, and – and that that's intimidating from the stands. So, I, oh my gosh, I can't imagine. I've never gone against a college or professional softball pitcher. And I don't think I want to. I've never been against a high school pitcher. <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's intense, man. I'm sitting there like, we, man, we, I don't look. That's <laughs> hey, I, that's why I tell the girls that like, you better than me, honey. You better than me. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> we need to relive that. We need to bring that back to life. That's something we gotta. Put back together. Oh yeah. Oh, don't worry. Hey, don't worry. We're gonna put that on YouTube. I'm gonna I'm I'm get with Monica because I know Monica well. Oh my and I'm god. I'm gonna get with her. I'm gonna, be like, I'm gonna be like, Yo, Monica, look. We're gonna have to look. We're gonna put this on our YouTube. <laughs> it's gonna be Beatty, Beatty versus Abbott. <laughs> We're gonna, 2020 we're Olympics on the goes. line. No. Yeah, seriously, that's that was, awesome. That was the one thing I wanted to ask. We've been asking all of our softball guests. What do you? How do you feel about? Um, the softball coming back into the Olympics for these girls and what that's going to mean for the sport. No, I think that's going to be freaking, they should have never took it away. Oh my gosh. Like it's, it's great. Anytime you get to represent your country, I don't even care if it's paper football. (laughs) The (laughs) fact that you get to represent your country speaks volumes. And I think that's really going to bring a dynamic back to youth, youth softball to make it even more, uh, um, um, exciting to watch go through the ranks of middle school to high school, high school to college, college to Olympics. I mean, come on, that gives these girls even more to dream about now. Yeah, so I think that that right there is the most important thing that they could have ever done for the sport. I feel like it's going to drive everything up from the marketing to the business and to the actual uh, holistic nature of the softball industry. Yeah, and girls signing up every year to play. I mean, that's that's oh, going to yeah. really change it. Because yeah, now it's like now, I mean, you still have the pro rankings, but to to represent the country, what? Yeah. When that happened, I said I can't wait to have a girl. I cannot wait. I mean, and we've had a few of, of the pro players on recently, and I mean, the grind and the effort that these, these women literally go through hell and back to just make it as an athlete to have a, a, a career to be able to support themselves and, you know, the work that they put in. And hopefully they get the, the same response that women's soccer's had over the years from the World Cup and the Olympics and all that because, man, they deserve it. I mean, these women, you talk about Mona, Ab- Monica Abbott, she's been doing it for two decades, it seems. I mean, you know, at the, at the highest levels across the world, it, it's unbelievable the talent that they have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. I tell you what, they got a fan in me. After, after when I saw that when that that master strikeout I had, I said, "Girl, you this industry has my respect for the rest of my life. I'll never talk talk about that no more." <laughs> you know, on that note, I mean, you've had you've had uh, a lot of um, you know relationships with friendships with uh, a lot of the softball players out there and coaches, um, just people in the softball community. Who would you recommend that we bring on to the show to talk some softball with? I mean, definitely, of course, you know, get Monica Shro with Package Deal because she has uh, those girls, her, uh, I think, I forgot, Morgan and the, and the two other girls, they have a part of Package Deal because they're entrepreneurs, but they didn't stop after college. They continued to pursue and helping the girls out. I think that would be a good one. Natasha Watley, she would be a great one to be on. Um, my Girlfriend. Brianna Cherry, I, my girlfriend, is a professional softball player, so she would love to probably be on there, ask her some questions about dating the softball and baseball motivator. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you but, know what? Um, I think we have um, – we she um, – I think we start. We did reach out to her, and she, and we she was just her really she was really busy at the time. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely have to do that. You, you, why don't you uh, put a little bug in her ear and let her know? Hey, we're, oh, yeah. we're ready. No worries. She's actually flying back into town today, and I let her know. I said, "Hey, girl, you got to get on that podcast. There are 
They are amazing. <laughs> awesome. She'll be like, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If our listeners, well, yeah, our softball girls, coaches, dads out there don't have a clue and they want to get more information on the things you're doing, where you're going to be at, uh, where can they find you at on your YouTube page, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, wherever you're at? List everything they can get more information at. And what's the best way to get in, t- uh, in contact with you with questions uh, or, you know, with the, the with clinics and camps that you're doing? The best thing to do, of course, uh, if you want to learn more about me uh, in general, just go to cjbatty.com, c-j-b-e-a-t-t-y.com. But on social media, the number one platform to reach me is Instagram. That's the one that's thriving. Uh, So if you have an Instagram account, account, just type in c-j-b-e-a-t-t-y 44. Uh, it's the one I have a blue check mark to verify me because there are some people out there that want to, I don't know why they want to be me, you know what I'm saying? But the blue check mark validates me and that's my, my official page. There can only be on one. Twitter, it's, there can only be one. It can only be one. <laughs> I mean, as much as I, I love how they're trying to grow the pages, helping, but if you want to know that it came from me specifically, follow the one with the check mark. Um, Twitter, CJ Beatty 44. Uh, I do do some Snapchat. If you're one of those Snapchat people, just type in CJ Beatty. Um, but if you have any questions, like about possibly doing a, a, a TSM workshop, make sure you send an email to motivationalnuggets at gmail.com. And I'm getting that. I mean, I'm in peak season right now. I'm actually, I got a couple more emails to respond with coming up from some softball events. And just stay tuned on all of those social media platforms. We do a good job on Facebook of updating my events where I'm going to be. I'm going to be up in New York area uh, in two weeks at the 1st of February for a baseball and softball mix workshop at Stack St. Thomas Aquinas uh, College. And I'm going to be up there in Nyack doing that on February the uh, February the 2nd. So, I mean, there's just a lot of things that, that's going down, but just stay tuned, man, because you just never, there's never a dull moment. I tell the parents, if you follow me on Instagram, put your seatbelt on because you're, you're, you're going to be taken for a ride. I think put your seatbelt on when you're listening to this podcast too, man. I, I enjoyed every second of this, and um, I'm actually excited that we get to have a baseball interview with you right after this. So. I, hope I hope you're not running on a treadmill listening to this one. You might you might want to sit on the exercise bike or you know make sure you're in the car. <laughs> yeah, no worries, man. I, yeah, I enjoy you guys. Man. Y'all do a phenomenal job. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, last question for you, and then uh, we'll put you on hold after this and uh, get ready for that baseball podcast. But uh, last question for you, playing professionally, what song did you choose as your walkout song to the plate? Ooh, I love grit. My life be like, ooh. Why did you pick that song? Man, I just, I mean, I love that. Uh, it's very, it's very super inspiration, inspirational and motivational. And, and uh, it's just one that makes me feel good on the inside. When I hear that, it really helps me uh, get the nervousness out. And when I hear that song, it gets me locked in. And grits are delicious. <laughs> yeah, oh, very. You know, I'm from North Carolina, so I just, I just had a bowl of grits. That's crazy. I just had a bowl of grits for this podcast. So that's wonderful. Awesome. Free game meal. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hold tight, man. We appreciate you coming on for the softball edition of Going Yard Podcast, and we wish you all the best of luck in the uh, softball community. Uh, I'm sure they love you, and they're going to love you even more after this. Oh, thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, CJ. Really appreciate it. Uh, this is fantastic information for all the, the everybody out there listening. So we can't wait to talk to you again in a little bit. Thank you. I'm on an island by my lonesome stranded. Low key and stand candid, reflect on all the things I try my hand at. Search for the equation to persuasions I'm used to find a comfort in the zone. Man, oh man, is he just he's a fireball man. He's so fun to listen to, and I'm gonna hold him to it. I wanna be in that softball music video. I can't wait, man. <laughs> one way or another. I, I, I can't wait for you to do that one. That's gonna be a good cameo. Hey, if it means I can fly away from this cold mess called Pennsylvania right now, that'd be fantastic. Man, I think everywhere across the you know, Midwest to the Northeast that's feeling this cold weather. But no, it was a great interview. Fantastic stuff. Man, 
big things coming from him in the softball world in the future. That's for sure. Can't wait. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch with him and uh, hopefully have him back on. But uh, as always, make sure you follow us on all things social media at Going Yard Podcast and on Twitter at Going Yard and number two. And we also have our brand new website. You can now bookmark it, please, at www goingyardpodcast.com I guess you don't really need to put the www's these days anymore but we're going to have everything on there um, we'll have all the episodes every way to find us we're going to have our store on there start selling the products that we uh, we talk about on this show all the time with uh, you know we, we've had uh, the backspin tea uh, guys on here glove hub guys we're going to get a bunch more uh, products on there for you guys to check out so book Marcus it'll make it a lot easier for you to find all of your baseball and softball uh, products yes you'll be able to find the links in our show notes and our bio and everything as well uh, leave us a five-star review subscribe to us on itunes soundcloud podbean google play uh, i'll tell you it's been tremendous the support we've had to start 2019 uh, we look to continue to build off it so we thank you for coming back every week and listening we love our softball fans gosh you guys are so passionate and we love it and we talked about it obviously in this uh this episode but Oh man, we we couldn't we couldn't ask for a better response from uh, you guys, gals, coaches, moms, dads, all the above. Um, so thank you so much, and that's a wrap for this episode for all of us here at the Going Yard Podcast, and for CJ Beatty, I'm Dan, and I'm Tyler. See ya later.